to talk today tonight about one of our uh, five trips to Vancouver Island. Um, Ellen and I have gotten really hooked on paddling the, the outer coast of Vancouver Island. We've done it five different summers now for usually about two weeks. Um, and one thing we like about Vancouver Island is you can actually drive there with your kayaks and your gear. Um, you get to take these beautiful ferries over to Vancouver Island. And um, it, it's uh, very, very easy to get to. Um, Xavier <clears throat> asked me to do this because um, when a couple of years ago, when he was in France visiting family and not kayaking, um, he was following um, our trip that I'd posted to Buzz. And uh, by using a, because I was using a satellite communicator that uh, broadcast our position and allowed me to send um, 160 character text messages. And these were posted on a web page. So he, Xavier and a number of other Bass members were following um, our trip. And I guess the, <clears throat> the, um, the, the inReach is the device on the right here. Um, uh, we also carried a, um, a couple of um, handheld GPSs and charts and plotting uh, tools and so forth. Um, and this was, the, this was the, uh, the message that caught um, his attention um, the day when I posted easy eight nautical mile paddle, stay funky tiny cabin, Ellen caught big blue fish, lingcod, yum, streams here dry, one day water, hours search, dig holes by seeps, then small trickle. And he got very worried about us and um, it got him hooked. So here we are, um, these are the, the places we've paddled mostly uh, down on the west coast between Nootka Island and the Brooks Peninsula that you see here. Um, um, but for this trip in 2018, we decided to look at the north end of the island, um, Port Hardy. And um, <clears throat> we, if you look at this, uh, this route, there's actually um, a lot of exposed coast here. Unlike further south on the island, where there's a lot of island groups that provide some protection, the north coast and the northwest are really quite exposed. Um, so we expected a lot of uh, rough paddling, uh, things like this off the Brooks Peninsula, but actually what we encountered was more of this um, and this, um, small swells and fairly calm winds on the days that we chose to paddle, which was great. So here's the route in the lower right is Port Hardy. Our, this is basically the end of the road on Vancouver Island. And we went across the north end of the island to San Joseph Bay. Um, what we did initially was we, we dropped a car off at San Joseph Bay. We drove on some logging roads. Actually, Ellen dropped the car off and was able to catch a hiker's shuttle um, back to Port Hardy. Uh, this northern, northern coast is very popular with backpackers. So that was an option. So we had a car waiting for us at the end of the trip. Um, and what you can see from this, um, this is roughly 100, mile, 100 miles of paddling, which is not very long. Um, and we spent 17 days, which is about twice as long as, as most people would, would plan for a trip like this. Um, it, it's just the way we do things. We wanted to spend several days exploring the God's Pocket area, the islands on the Northeast side. Um, and, um, and then we wanted to have time to do some hikes. Um, we had a lot of layover days. We wanted to make sure we had plenty of time for layovers due to weather, especially um, uh, at the Nuwiti Bar, we're at the mouth uh, where it opens into the ocean. There's a, a bar that's uh, notorious for strong currents and uh, breaking waves. And likewise, Cape Scott has strong currents and a reef extending out. So these are places where a paddler sometimes have to wait several days for the right weather to, to continue. And um, so we planned a lot of extra time and um, you'll see what we did with it. We did our homework. Um, bringing uh, charts and plotting some courses. And our very first day, uh, we, we couldn't get going till late afternoon because of the, the, the sh car shuttle. And we needed to, to uh, go along the shore of Vancouver Island and we wanted to head over to Balaclava Island. Um, and when we got to about halfway, <coughs> um, uh, some rainstorms moved in and the fog was right down in the water and we could not see any islands out here at all. But with the, um, the help of our compass and our GPS, it was pretty easy to, um, to make this crossing. Um, you can see we headed straight across 
to uh, no one point where we camped uh, for about four nights and did a bunch of, of day paddles. So here we are arriving our first evening in the misty rain. Um, really beautiful uh, campsite where we spent four nights. When we're in wet weather like this, we, um, we use a, a, a Megalite uh, kitchen fly that we set up simply by putting in four stakes and raising a pole. And then you have a place to put your gear while you uh, unpack. And then uh, we set up a tarp and then erect our tent underneath that to give us a little bit of a dry space um, around the tent. We can also use the tarp to collect rainwater for drinking. We were surrounded by about a dozen eagles perched on trees all around. Um, another uh, kind of wildlife we saw was uh, banana slugs. Uh, they were along this trail that we had trampled down and um, we were doing them a big favor because these banana slugs really liked these little yellow flowers and we brought them down to ground level. So uh, after the first day, our, our trail was paved with banana slugs and it was like a minefield to traverse. Um, in addition to banana slugs and eagles, we also had some other wildlife. Our first morning, we were greeted by this wolf. It's a subspecies that's found in the islands. It's a bit smaller than the mainland wolf. And uh, this one, uh, we've seen wolves many times on Vancouver Island, and this one was not behaving properly. Um, wolves normally are very shy and afraid of humans. Um, this one was hanging around like it was expecting uh, a meal. And that's a really dangerous sign for uh, wolves. Um, wolves become ha habituated to getting food from humans, and this causes uh, attacks. So um, we did what Parks Canada recommends, which is to uh, yell and, and flail our arms and throw rocks, and we chased it off. Um, it came back again um, that evening for dinner, and we repeated the behavior, and that seemed to work in training the wolf. It didn't come back the rest of our, of our visit. Um, we spent a few days paddling around in the mist and rain, and it was very beautiful. Um, we also did some early morning paddles um, uh, that were at a, a low minus tide. And um, this area between these two islands is famous for scuba diving um, because of the subtidal life. And we actually got a glimpse of this. Normally, when we're on Vancouver Island, we see a lot of intertidal life like this. But there's a really different assemblage that lives subtidally. And at a minus tide, if you look down through the water and stick your camera down, you can actually see a whole different, uh, a whole different world. Um, various kinds of sea stars, um, lots of more diverse uh, anemones. Um, here's uh, some tube worms that when they're, when they're out, um, you can see the tentacles they feed with. This was about eight inches long, this tube. Um, crabs, um, several kinds of uh, jellyfish. Uh, some kelp crabs, and, and lots more anemones. There's actually a scallop in the lower left here. And then uh, some amazing sea cucumbers, um, both feeding and, and just uh, moving around. Um, some just all different colors. These were about eight inches long and um, they came in all different colors and uh, body forms, and some of them looked like they were designed by Dr. Seuss. Um, we'd never seen these before out there. After a few days, the sun began to come out, and we uh, were able to warm up a bit, dry out. Um, we explored some of the island, and, and we particularly like looking at old um, uh, First Nations village sites like this one that would have been full of dugout uh, canoes and and um, uh, square uh, houses. There's really no ruins left of these, of these settlements. We also paddled around the islands um, exploring God's Pocket. We visited this lighthouse. Many Canadian lighthouses are still staffed and uh, the keepers uh, made us welcome and, and we uh, had a nice lunch at the lighthouse. Um, enjoying the view across the inland passage of uh, cruise ships going by. We feel 
we're much happier and feel a lot safer uh, traveling in, in, uh, in our kayak mode these days. Um, and on returning to camp after four days, we discovered a visitor. Um, this was the one and only kayaker we met in 17 days of our trip. We were kind of astonished. Apparently, late June, early July is, is considered fairly early up there. Um, and this fellow, Steve, was a uh, uh, resident of Vancouver Island and a uh, experienced kayaker in this area. He had been around Cape Scott six times. Um, and he was setting off on a 26-day trip from Port Hardy all, all the way around to Tofino. And since we were going the same way at that point, we decided to paddle together for about four days. And the next segment of our trip was going from the lower right here, Balaclava Island, around the north end of the island. And we had originally planned to, to make more stops and do some hiking along the way, but we saw that we had a really good weather window ahead of us and decided to take advantage of it. And so uh, in four days, we paddled around the end of the island. We were going roughly uh, 10 to 15 nautical miles a day, uh, mostly paddling in the mornings before the, the wind would come up. Again, uh, Nuwiti Bar is, is right here. This was our, one of our major concerns uh, for rough weather and also the tip of Cape Scott. So here we are heading north up the channel. Um, we spent our first night on this beautiful island near the mouth. Uh, this also had been a uh, First Nations um, village site and the actual, um, this was the, actually the cove where the village was, uh, this beach um, with the flat clearing behind it for housing. Um, the next morning we got up at 4.30 and we're on the water at 7.30. Um, started to head around and encountered this very sad sight. This was a, um, a we think a young uh, doll's porpoise. And I'm hoping you can see the vid short video clip I took of it. Um, it didn't seem to be in very good shape. Um, and there being no marine mammal center to call, we, we left it in peace and continued. We saw a black bear on the beach, or for only one of this trip, actually. We saw a number of humpback whales. Um, and um, actually, a couple of days later, we heard this sound like, um, like fireworks in the distance. And it happened to be the 4th of July, which you know is an occasion for fireworks in the US, not so much in Canada. And um, we got out, I got out my binoculars and looked offshore where the sound was coming from and saw a huge pod of humpback whales all tail slapping. And they were about a, judging from the, the timing of the tail slapping to when I heard the sound, it looked like it was about um, two miles away. Um, and it, it really sounded like thunder. So here we are um, paddling along. Let's see, here's looking for the, uh, we're approaching uh, Nuwiti Bar and here's a chart of Nuwiti Bar. So Vancouver Island is on the south side here and um, on the north is, is Hope Island. And the blue area of the reef is only about, um, let's see, these are in meters, so this is about 15 feet deep, and even the white areas here, the deeper areas are only about 35 feet deep. So when you have five knot currents and you have big swells coming in and wind, um, it can be an extremely rough area, um, as our friend Steve was able to, uh, to tell us. So we were uh, wondering what it would be like, and here it was, um, absolutely a lake. And we, we paddled around uh, past um, rafts of sea otters, um, and uh, just an absolutely splendid day. We spent a couple nights camping on these beautiful beaches on the north coast uh, that packbackers uh, use. Um, we could see in the distance the mountains of the British Columbia uh, uh, inland and um, a little more sand that we like, but uh, it, it did just fine. There also is a, a ranger station um, at Cape Sudal Beach. Um, 
backpackers um, pay a, and we also paid a $10 per night per person permit fee to camp along the north side of the island. And we had we purchased the permits in advance and the rangers uh, patrol the area and are very friendly. Um, Ellen had um, messed up her skeg cable and it required a little repair on the beach, which was uh, not a problem. Um, and finally, the morning came to, um, to head around uh, Cape Scott. And here, uh, Steve and Ellen are preparing for uh, this journey. Um, we also found a commercial fisherman uh, taking shelter. And here we are setting out as the clouds are building up. There is a front moving in. And we're heading around um, Cape Scott. And, and here's the, the route. Um, you can see it's a rocky headland. Um, there's actually a reef that goes out about three quarters of a mile. Uh, so it's fairly shallow with a lot of boomers. Um, and Steve told us that uh, he'd seen it extremely rough out there. And one time even um, carried, portaged his kayak and gear across the sand neck at the base. Although the, the sand dunes here are quite large. This is, um, uh, would be quite a task. But um, anyway, Cape Scott is, is a well-known um, landmark for kayakers to, to, uh, to weather. And some kayakers, I know people have waited several days there. Um, and here we're setting out, you can see we have perfect conditions. We're seeing, uh, uh, actually Cape Scott is on the left and the island in the distance is the Scott Islands. And here we are rounding the Cape, um, very small swells. A uh, piece of cake, um, and then as we came around, the rain, the rainstorm uh, set in, and the rest of our journey was through mist and rain. But um, as you can see, uh, pretty much calm and very small swells, and we uh, took advantage of of uh, Steve's uh, cart to uh, move our boats up a long beach at low tide, and we then uh, had um, lots of time left before. We needed to be in San Joseph Bay. We'd made it around the difficult part of the trip, and we took a break now um, to do a lot of hiking and sightseeing uh, for the next four days. We set up a very nice camp. This was a, a beach shelter of uh, logs, and we, we erected our mega mid to give us shelter from the wind. We did have some windy days during our layover. Um, and from here, we did a number of, of day hikes. Uh, one was along this old plank road out to the lighthouse. This was built during World War II when a, uh, a top secret radar station was built on Cape Scott and later was used as the base for the lighthouse. And from the lighthouse, this is the view of the lighthouse keepers homes and the shops and the generator houses and so forth. And um, here's a view of, of the Scott Island in the distance. And this is the head lighthouse keeper and his dog, and there's also an assistant. Um, these Canadian lighthouse keepers, they work really hard. They're out there year round. Uh, they get only three weeks off, and otherwise they are working 10 hour shifts, each of them. So the lighthouse is staffed 20 hours a day. And um, it's, it takes a certain kind of person, and, and the lighthouse keepers we met were very friendly and happy to talk. We spent about an hour chatting with him, and then ate our lunch at the uh, picnic table nearby. And he said, would you like some tea? And he promptly came out with um, tea with, uh, with lemon and honey. And we had a very elegant lunch there at the lighthouse. So uh, it's, a, it's a pity that we don't have that option in the US anymore with these unmanned lighthouses. We had a chance to do a little more exploring of, of beaches and sea stacks. Um, and then the, um, the next, oh, and the, the, um, the sand neck that separates the Cape from the main island um, has some beautiful dunes. And uh, back in the late 1800s, um, this was actually farmed by a Danish farmer. He, he put in uh, fence lines and you can still see some of them. There were lots of beet strawberries in bloom and uh, in fruit. And we collected a lot of them to uh, turn into a, uh, pancake, strawberry pancake uh, dessert after dinner that night in our little uh, beach house. Another day, uh, we went paddling around locally and Ellen uh, did a bunch of fishing. And Ellen has been a self-taught fisher woman. Um, she finds, she mostly fishes for rockfish and her favorite trick is to make like a sea otter and to hold her kayak in place in the wind, she wraps herself in kelp. 
while she fishes. Um, and I went uh, tide pooling and admiring various anemones and, and feeding some of them. Um, I'm gonna skip the video here. And when I came back, she was in the process of landing a rockfish. It took her about 10 minutes to play this rockfish. It was the largest one she caught on the trip. Um, it was really fighting and um, you can see she's still got the kelp wrapped around her. Um, and rockfish are very challenging to land because they have all these sharp spines that have toxins on them. You don't want to get poked. Um, and it, it's very difficult to, to bring them aboard. And what she has to do is get it into a bag so she can, you can see that it's now in the bag uh, on her uh, spray skirt. And then she can um, bring it back to shore. And within an hour, um, we're enjoying a, a fish dinner. So she did this about three or four times during the trip. Now another day we headed off on a, about a 10 or 12 mile um, hike um, along beaches. When you come to a, a, a beach and you're looking for the trail to get to the next beach, um, they're usually marked with lots of, uh, of buoys. Um, this is a rainforest and there are some wet trails. There are ruins of old bridges from when this was, there was a road that the settlers made. Um, lots of uh, beach walking. Here's another uh, trail entrance. It's well marked. You can't miss it. A few old growth uh, spruce trees. And um, in this satellite view, you can see Cape Scott in the upper left. Um, and we hiked along the north side of the island here and to this big Hansen's Lagoon. And back in 1897, a group of Danish immigrants to the Midwestern US decided to try their hand at farming on northern Vancouver Island. Uh, the British Columbia government was making land available to settlers. And uh, they, uh, they found this area of meadow that they thought would make good farmland. And here's a, um, Here's a view of that meadow area. And what you can see it, on the left side, there's this long line that represents a dike that they built in 1899. They spent all year building this dike with mostly hand labor and horses, and then um, had a big party on New Year's Eve, 1899, to celebrate the completion of the dike, which was to keep the salt water out of the, the meadows. Well, on January 1st, there was an enormous storm and a, and a king tide, and the, um, the, the levee was pretty much destroyed. And it took them another year or two to complete a new levee that was better built. And they made this all into farmland, and it was uh, reasonably successful. They did dairy farming and cattle, and they, they grew crops, of, uh, they grew produce. Um, and uh, this is a, a photo of the, um, the road as it was at that time going out into the fields. And this is a view of the exact same spot. You can see the road going out behind Ellen. And um, a quote from a, a, a settler from 1919 uh, says, in summer, the lagoon is the scene of great activity. Cowbells are ringing and vehicles are traveling the good broad road the government has built through the grasslands to the dike. Mowers and sides are busy, busy, and in the latter part of August, hundreds of haycocks are seen. The air is dense with the smell of cured hay. Meadowlarks and robin voice contention in rippling notes, and the pygmy owl is busy hunting grasshoppers. It is a wonderful smiling spot surrounded by morose and silent forests. Um, during this period, and we actually hiked out um, out the levees, out the road, uh, you can see the old fence posts and the ditches, um, but the levee, of course, is now, is now breached in many places. And at its heyday, they, um, they built a community center and schoolroom. They had about 25 or 30 students, and this photo was taken in 1914 when they were having a big harvest festival with about 200 people in attendance. Um, this is what's left of that building today, just some moss covered uh, planks and a lot of um, metal pieces. I'm imagining these might have been from chairs in the schoolhouse. This was probably a door to a, a, a wood stove, um, a plow. 
Um, this was a, a farmhouse called the Spencer Ranch that was about a half mile away. And we think we found uh, the ruins of this exact house um, uh, on our hike. And there was an old tractor that was probably from the 1920s. Um, eventually, the, uh, the settlement failed. Actually, two waves of settlement failed. And it was mainly because um, there was no way for them to get their produce and their dairy products to market. Um, they tried. They bought a ship, which became was wrecked. They built another ship. It was wrecked. They had no good harbor. And the government had promised to build them a road out to the end of the island, but they never actually appropriated the funds. So eventually the settlers gave up and, and abandoned um, all the land. So after um, a nice interlude <clears throat> uh, on, on this bay, four nights, um, we still had uh, another five or six days left in our trip um, to, to make our way down the coast to San Joseph Bay. Um, we spent a night here at Lowry Bay, uh, date, that was July 10. Um, and then went around uh, Cape Russell and spent a couple nights on a little island while we waited out a windstorm and then finished our trip with two nights on the beach at San Joseph Bay, in which we hiked up a mountain uh, between San Joseph Bay and this Otter Bay here. So this is uh, heading uh, down, down the coast from Cape Scott. Um, it's, it's all a wild coast. We weren't seeing any other people. I think for, for about six days, we didn't see another person. And this is the beach at uh, Lowry Bay. Um, this is with very low swells. And you can see there's a, a fair amount of surf. Um, there was one other more protected beach that was sheltered, but only landable at high tide. Um, and one uh, notable feature of this location is this, this cabin that was built back, I think in the early 1980s by, by some private individuals. and They've maintained it all these years, and it's it's really kept quite tight. There are no mice or rats in it, um, and um, it's only visited uh, maybe every month or so in the summer because it's so hard to get to. Um, inside, it's very small, just a couple of bunks and a wood stove and a counter. Um, and uh, Ellen caught a lingcod that um, had this amazing blue flesh we had for dinner, um, and the walls of this cabin are covered with a graffiti of, of accounts of people's visit to the cabin. And um, here's one story that I photographed. Our boat caught on fire, um, had to abandon it and swim to shore. Mike and Earl, July 2, 2000. Um, here's a posting from someone many of you know. Trip around Vancouver Island. There's a, a kayak and a paddle. Uh, Leon and Shauna. Um, these are the, the instructors with uh, Boat, Body, and Blade in, in the Puget Sound era. era. Um, this was August 12, 2011. And with them was uh, Justine Kurgan then, um, who was there along for part of the circumnavigation. Um, so we added our own graffiti to the wall and, um, and um, headed on the next day. But before we did that, we were really planning on replenishing our water supply for the rest of the trip. We could carry about four or five um, days worth of water and the guidebook had assured us there was a really good stream here on the beach and um, there was no stream on the beach and we we clambered over the logs we went inland we searched everywhere we could not find any running water so we were getting a little nervous because we were down to our last day's supply and um, our next destination was going to be a small island that would probably be dry so we uh, started looking for moist places. This is a blowdown tip-up mound and uh, found a, a wet spot and dug a hole. And within an hour, we had a little puddle of water. And uh, Ellen did some uh, digging uh, elsewhere. And we were finding little bits of water here and there. But finally, at low tide, we went walking uh, south along the coast and found a ravine with a little trickling stream coming down. And we were saved. We were able to filter water for the rest of our trip and even uh, fill up some buckets to take a, a sponge bath. Um, and you can see Ellen looks very happy here. Um, and the next day we, uh, we headed off, um, mainly because we knew there was gonna be uh, some wind coming and we wanted to get out of this exposed location into, into a very sheltered place. We stayed in the Hope Islands right down here. 
um, for um, two nights and we were basically stranded on this beautiful little island all by ourselves. Um, here's the trip down there, the wind is building up. And um, here's a view of the island from, whoa, I just hit the wrong button here. Sorry about that. So here's a view from the mountain looking down at our, we were camped right in this island right in here. So it was a very nice uh, protected spot. Um, here we're, we're coming in um, in the fog and rain. I had a nice protected campsite and, uh, and kitchen area. And we spent the next day just exploring our, our beautiful island, um, the sea stacks, the, um, the shoreline, and spending some time uh, finishing our books, uh, huddled up behind a log to stay out of the wind and had, our, had a fire. And finally, it was time to head back to uh, head out to um, San Joseph Bay, which would be our final campsite on this uh, beautiful big beach. There were some interesting um, sea stacks and one of the nicest uh, water supplies. And on our layover day here, we climbed this St. Patrick's Mountain here, which overlooks the island that we had been camped on previously. And it was a, a unmaintained trail that was quite rough. It was a very difficult hike, but, but a, a beautiful uh, summit. Um, and quite unusual for uh, a mountaintop is to find a bog and a pygmy forest on top. Um, there were a lot of these uh, sphagnum mosses and insectivorous plants like this uh, sundew that traps insects on um, little sticky drops of adhesive that are uh, uh, on the ends of those hairs. Um, and beautiful views of both the coastline and the interior of Vancouver Island, most of which um, is heavily logged. And finally, the next, um, next day, it was time to uh, cross the bar into the river and paddle a, a few miles um, up the San Joseph River to our uh, takeout um, in, in freshwater, actually, although it was tidal. And uh, this was my final post uh, that I sent to, um, to my uh, friends on the satellite communicator, crossed bar, paddled up river till water was fresh, miles paddled 99, Miles hiked 22, capes rounded three, nights 16, campsites eight, kayaker scene one, finished. And uh, that was the end of the trip. Um, this is a view of um, Vancouver Island from the Northwest showing on the left side, the trip that we took in 2018 and showing on the right side, the, some of the previous trips south of the Brooks Peninsula. And our goal at the end of this trip was we want to explore um, the area in between. Um, I've heard from, on good authority from Penny Wells that this area north of the Brooks Peninsula is really a, a beautiful, amazing area. It's also very remote um, wilderness and um, it would be really cool to, to do this other trip, which we had planned to do last summer. Um, and instead I spent uh, six weeks in Palo Alto at the in and near the Stanford Hospital and um, had a very productive summer getting rid of a cancer and was looking forward to going up there this summer, but looks like that may be on hold and maybe next year we hope to get back up there. So that is the end of my presentation. If anyone is still out there, I'm gonna to try to get off of screen sharing. How do I do this? Um, that was an amazing presentation, Tom. I'm going to pause share. Um, yeah, many beautiful places. Thank you so much for sharing. Fantastic. Totally awesome. I can't wait to go. OK, I think we've got you back. Um, any questions? So Tom, I could couldn't help noticing your your the person you met. I, I forgot his name. He looked like in, in one of the pictures he was anchoring his boat. His boat was empty in the water. 
uh, but not on the beach. Can you can you comment on his practice, how he was doing that? He did it that one day, and I can't remember quite why it was. Ellen, do you remember? Ellen, you might have to unmute. Press your space bar. Yeah, I don't remember why he did that. I, I mean, if, I know it must have had something to do with the tides because we had we were having really huge tidal ranges and it may be that he wanted to have his boat i think that was the day was that the day we we parted and he oh. was no no any yeah I, I'm not sure. well anyway I, I i can relate to this picture i mean uh having a boat fully loaded you know and if you're alone and imagining a low uh, 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 with a huge tide, you know, moving this boat through the through the beach must be a pain. And so I noticed he had wheels, and uh, he had he had these big, you know, the regular big wheels, and he just kept them on the top on the deck. I mean, this guy when he got in his boat, it was he had so he would get in the boat, and then he would start stuffing stuff into the cockpit. And first of all, he paddled in shorts, and he stuffed a huge amount of stuff in the cockpit such that basically if he went over, he wouldn't be able to get out of the cockpit. And, and then he had the wheels on the top and he, his philosophy was, I'm paddling alone. If I go over, I'll drown. So why worry about getting out of the boat? <laughs> that was, and, and so that, and he had a huge amount of stuff. He had an i. He had a like a Kindle kind of thing, you know, with with e ink, um, and he would he had a, a little uh, beach chair, and he would set up a, a tarp over himself and sit on the beach in the beach chair and read his Kindle <laughs> during the day, and he was extremely um, conservative about when he would paddle. Makes sense. Tom, did you get weather forecasts on these little handheld devices you had? So um, we try to get weather forecasts whenever we can on the brain radio and the VHF, but there were some times when we could not get a signal from the weather uh, weather antennas, the, 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 the antennas for the area that we were in. So um, we used the, um, the inReach and um, Bill um, Rostenberg was our contact and we were communicating with him each day. So in some cases, he would send us a very abbreviated weather forecast. We worked out a code with him so that he could give us a very complete weather forecast in 160 characters. But also um, in recent years, the inReach has um, added a feature and now you can actually get a detailed weather forecast, a point forecast <laughs> for a dollar each. And uh, so, we often would make use of that. And it so we had pretty good weather information um, during the trip. Thank you. So um, Tom, the, your presentation was just fabulous, especially the photography. Holy cow, what were you using for a camera? Um, well, you know, we're using the Olympus uh, Tough 4 that everyone uses. Um, and then on land, I did have a nicer, um, it was a kind of a nice point and shoot. Um, and then, you know, a lot of cameras, were, a lot of photos were taken with my iPhone. Um, I meant to also say that um, I know that the picture quality on Zoom is often not very good, depending on the bandwidth. Um, I have posted these photos in an Adobe Lightroom album, so you can see them at much higher resolution. If you go to my blog, which is uh, tomcolton.org, all one word, tomcolton.org, um, there's a link there to the photos. They're really well done. And I know that we've talked about the north side of the uh, Brooks Peninsula, and I certainly hope that you guys get a chance to go back and do that. And if you would like my annotated charts from when we did it, um, I'll give them to you. I would love to look at them. We actually have all the charts we need, but I would love to look at yours and then maybe pass them on to someone else who might be able to use them. Okay, because if 
I have charts of the whole thing and cruising guides and notes and I'm, I'm quite willing to pass it on. Right. Well, you've definitely inspired us. <laughs> that that yep. would be really generous. That really sounds wonderful. It'd be great to see all, all of that. Okay. I'll put your name on it. If anyone else is thinking of doing trips on this area, we do have all of the charts, um, the guidebook, um, and would be happy to share uh, local knowledge about a lot of these areas. So Tom, how accurate did you find the guidebooks? Did, did you find good literature and did you, I mean, except for the water supply, uh, did, you, did you find what you expected and could you really rely on these books? Well, there is really just one Bible for this area. It's a book by John Comantis and it's a, it's a fantastic guidebook. And um, I would say that, that that place where we didn't find water was about the only glitch we've ever seen in it. It really is, is an excellent guidebook. Thank you. I think, uh, I think this area might be very overcrowded the next time when, when we can be confined because you, you probably inspired a lot of us, you know, I can't wait to go there. <laughs> Hey, Tom. Um, I, I know we talked about Steve possibly anchoring his kayak. Did y'all do anything like that? We never did. Um, we always pull our kayak up um, well above where we think the high tide is. And there is about a 13 foot tide range. And then we always tie it to logs or trees or something uh, with our, um, our bow lines and if necessary, tow lines to make sure that even if there were a really strong wind um, or an unusually high tide or big waves, there's no chance we're gonna lose our boats. You may recall a talk that I gave um, many years ago about our very first trip to Vancouver Island when we did lose our boats and we are gonna make sure that doesn't happen again. <laughs> I, I also noticed y'all had bear cans, but you also hung them? Um, we use um, a combination of bear canisters and um, ursacs. Okay. And ursacs are a, uh, made of Kevlar cloth and they have a drawstring and then you tie the, um, the bag to a tree. You don't necessarily hang it, but you have to tie it to something so the bear can't carry it off. So even though uh, no, no other kayakers that we've met on Vancouver Island use bear canisters, there are black bears everywhere. And um, they generally are not a problem, but we like to keep it that way. And so we, tr we really try to keep our, our food secured from the bears. I was actually thinking about the wolf too. Since he seemed a little brave, he would just dig in if you didn't have anything sealed. That's, that's quite possible, yeah. Um, I saw I saw that you had a sale or the other your friend uh, the person you met uh, had a little round sale yes and how does that work I saw that he didn't have any oh, any paddles in his head had just the sale so how and, did he balance well he had a rudder that he could use for steering while he was sailing um, and as you saw it was just like a hoop sail very small and he could simply hold on to it. Um, but other than that, I, and he just used it that one time. Most of the time when we were with him, we didn't have either, we didn't have any wind or the wind was not with us. So we didn't see it too much. I was wondering if you carried that shovel. No, that was at the cabin. That was the night that we were at that little cabin and the shovel was, was there. So uh, we, we had a trowel with us, but we did not have a, any large tools. So what was your strategy for fishing? Did you, did you rely on catching fish to eat or was the fish in addition to your planned diet? Ellen? We, we had planned enough 
calories that we wouldn't need to catch fish. Um, but we did do some local foraging. We, so I would go fishing and if I caught a fish, then we would eat it. And um, the other thing was that we foraged for uh, plant material too. We ate uh, some kinds of seaweed. We ate the little, um, oh, what are they called? You know, those little, they, you, when you dry them, they're like little poppers. Um, and, uh, and then we also, on those, on the dunes at the neck of Cape Scott, the sand dunes, um, there was an amazing abundance of strawberries that were ripe at that time. And so we ate a lot of strawberries, although they were a little sandy. You didn't want to chew them. Um, you just kind of mushed them around with your tongue and then swallowed the sand and everything. And, and we also um, harvest uh, some of the, um, oh, what's it called? The sea rocket. We use sea rocket and, um, and wild onions and would mix those with uh, bacon bits and um, cab a cabbage that we had. So we, we had fresh, fresh greens a fair, a fair amount from the beaches. But we didn't count on any of that. It was just, that was all extra calories. Great. So if you would do it again, would you, do, do you think you would count on it or do you think it's, it's, it's too unpredictable? I don't think I'm a good enough fishing person plant. to count on it. Um, <laughs> yeah. I would say, uh, what, about half the time I went out fishing, I caught a fish. Um, and I never bothered to try to catch more than one fish because one was usually enough for the, the two of us for a meal. And we didn't have any way of storing the fish. Um, and it doesn't last very well. So I, maybe if I got better at fishing, <laughs> We could count on that, but um, I need more practice, and I'm sure not getting it now. I hear you. What did you use for bait? Um. So. So when I bought the fishing pole two, three years ago, I guess it was now, um, for our, for that trip, which was before this trip. Um, I bought the fishing pole in a, in a um, sporting goods store that, well, so the story is, is that Tom drove up to Campbell River and I flew from uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil <laughs> through Toronto and, uh, and Vancouver to Campbell River, which is up at the north end of, uh, sort of up, upper north end of Vancouver Island. And Tom picked me up at the airport. And before he picked me up at the airport, after I'd been in transit for 25 hours, he had gone to this sporting goods store in Campbell River and told them that I was gonna be arriving <laughs> and I wanted to buy a fishing pole and start fishing. And so they put together a package of a pole and a reel and line and um, and then they uh, they recommended lures and so I I used lures which are these big they were like they looked like little like um, silicon fish they had real beady glass eyes and they were they are designed so that they have a tail that flips a lot flips around when you pull them through the water and and I mean they were like five inches long. I, I thought, <laughs> how, some, how could a fish ever fit this in its mouth? Um, and, and I used those. And what I found was that they needed to be fairly uh, bright. And uh, after, if, if fish um, struck at them and then they lost their eyes and things like that, then the fish wouldn't pay attention to them anymore. So, um, but anyway, I used those lures and they were actually quite successful. 